All right, welcome to Discrete Math Lectures, Lesson 3. This is going to be proofs with some symbolic logic. So why are we learning proofs? Proofs are used to show how a set of hypotheses, these are also called premises, assumptions, and so on, can be combined in various ways to arrive at some conclusion. Now each step of these proofs follows the laws of like logic. So in mathematics, a statement is not accepted as valid or correct unless it is accompanied by a proof. So uh, an important distinction here, proofs show an argument's validity, but not its soundness or strength. So that means a proof is only true if all of its premises are true, but we can't determine um, whether or not the premises are true till we actually you know, look for some sense data, uh, collect evidence, and so on. So here's a structure of proof. So most, most proofs begin with a declaration of our premises, so statements that you're allowed to assume. And then with these premises, you make inferences or logical rearrangements using the rules of inference, which we'll be discussing later on. So finally, you end with your conclusion. And this is typically beginning with something like therefore or thus. And then we're going to have, or even like a triple dot thing, this represents therefore. Um, and it'll also end with something like QED, this is what we want to show, or just the box. So here are some proof techniques. We have our direct proof, which is where we can prove our conclusion directly from the premises. Uh, we use rules of inference to, man to manipulate our premises to get them into what we wanted to prove. So that was the direct proof. And then next we have our proof by contraposition. So this is where we assume the conclusion to be false, not Q. And then we want the show, not P. Because this is logically equivalent to P implies Q. Like so. Okay. So, and then finally, we all have our proof by contradiction, also known as reductio ad absurdum. So this is where we assume uh, premises that are the opposite and then we derive a contradiction. So that's proof by contradiction, and we'll show you that in a second. So here are some of the rules of inference. So one of the biggest ones that we'll use is modus ponens. That would be P implies Q, P, therefore Q. Uh, another big one is modus tollens. So P implies Q, not Q, therefore not P. Disjunctive syllogism, P or Q, not P, therefore Q. That's also a good one. Adjunction. Um, this is kind of illustrating the point that each line of a proof is kind of being anded together. So P, Q, therefore P and Q is adjunction. And then conversely, uh, simplification is going to be uh, P and Q, therefore P. Since P is true and Q is true, at least they're assumed to be true, then just P is going to be true if P and Q is true. And then addition, because P is assumed to be true, um, adding stuff onto it, like or Q, um, isn't really going to affect it because P is already true. So, uh, continuing on, there's a biconditional introduction. So, P implies Q and Q implies P um, creates P if and only if Q. That makes the arrow go both ways. Another big one is the hypothetical syllogism. So P implies Q, Q implies R, so the Qs kind of cancel out. It just goes straight to P implies R. <clears throat> you can think of it that way. There's also the material implication. P implies Q. This is logically equivalent here to um, P, if not P, or Q. And I discussed that earlier. We have exportation, which is P and Q implies R. This is equivalent to uh, P implies quantity, Q implies R. Contraposition, we discussed that earlier. And then resolution, so P or Q and not P or R. We can eliminate the P because it's being, its opposite is present in the next uh, premise, right? So Q or R. So then there's also some rules using quantifiers. There's universal instantiation, which is where we say for all x, some proposition or some predicate p of x is true. So we say, therefore, p of x. 
There's also existential instantiation. There exists an x such that p of x, therefore p of x. Universal generalization. Uh, this p of x, therefore, um, for all x p of x, this is sort of like in the opposite uh, direction of instantiation. There's also existential generalization. p of x, right, therefore, uh, there exists an x p of x. So this one, totally cool. Um, and then universal instantiation, totally cool. These first two are great. Um, you can use them pretty much um, liberally as you want. You start getting into um, like a gray area. You try to say <clears throat> something, therefore all. P of X has to be chosen arbitrarily. So in order for this to work. And even then, uh, this is kind of, a, uh, kind of an iffy um, way of doing things. Same with this guy right here. Um, saying that there exists um, something, uh, therefore, there exists an x such that this happens, um, therefore, this is going to be true. That's also kind of iffy, but um, because what if it's not the right x? But we'll just go with it. Um, so you just have to be careful using these, so careful. So here's an example of a direct proof using modus tollens, or sorry, we're going to be proving modus tollens here. So we have P implies Q as our first premise, right? And then we'll have um, not Q as our next premise. So we use our material implication to transform P implies Q into this guy right here. And now we just use our conjunction law to um, put these on the same line. Okay. So we just put that guy right there in combination with this one. Then we just use the distribution law to distribute it out. And then we use a disjunctive syllogism to get rid of this or right here. So we have not Q and not P. And then we use our simplification law to eliminate this guy right here. So we get not P, which is what we wanted to show. So this is won't be as symbolic, but it's still going to get the point across. So this right here is actually supposed to be x squared, not x2. I just couldn't get the uh, superscript working for that one. And even then, that's a bad x squared. Just run with it. So we have to prove that if x squared is even, then x is even. So <clears throat> it's going to be hard to go backwards using this like a square root or something. So instead, we're going to suppose that x is odd. So uh, if something is odd, then we use our definition from the last uh, presentation, such that uh, there exists integer k, such that uh, x is going to be 2k plus 1, right? Then we just do some algebra, then x squared is going to be 2k plus 1 squared, which is 4k squared plus 4k plus 1, which is 2 times 2k squared plus 2k plus 1. Note that 2k squared plus 2k is an integer, right? So that's going to be very useful for us, right? So that means 2 times some integer plus 1 is going to be x squared, which then means that x squared is odd. So um, using contraposition, if x, or it's, this is just a direct implication, so if x is odd, then x squared is odd, which is what we've just shown. Then, by contraposition, if x squared is even, then x is even. This is what we wanted to show. And then next we have our proof by contradiction. So this is going to be the famous proof uh, done by Euclid, I think, or Euler. One of those guys. So we're going to prove that there are infinitely many primes. So here we're going to assume the opposite. Assume that there are finitely many primes. So if there's like a finite number of things, we just choose the largest one because there has to be a largest one, right? And then we set that equal to p. So p factorial, if you remember what factorial is, it's going to be p times p minus 1 times dot 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 all the way down to 1, right? So we're just multiplying all the numbers from 1 up to p together. That's going to be equal to p factorial, right? Okay, so then p factorial is, is divisible by all integers from 2 to p, obviously, because that's just how p factorial is defined. It's just 
all the numbers from 2 to p multiply together. So if we add 1, then every time we divide by each one of those integers, um, we're going to get a remainder by 1. So it's going to be a near miss for all of those. right? So then uh, we can't divide any of those numbers from 2 to p into p factorial plus 1. So since none of the primes before it could divide into it, p factorial plus 1 has to be prime. But p factorial plus 1 is clearly bigger than p, right? So p can't be the largest prime, therefore there are infinitely many primes. And here's a bonus, proof by construction. We want to prove that there are um, um, numbers that are not um, rational, such that a to the b is rational. So let a equal b equals square root 2. So square root 2 clearly is irrational. So if square root 2 to the square root 2 is rational, then the proof is complete. Otherwise, it is irrational. So we just let a equal um, the result from before and b equal square root of 2. Then we just apply the definition again. Do some multiple, use the fact that um, raising a power to a power is just multiplying the exponents. So then we have square root of 2 raised to the 2 power is going to be 2. 2 is an element of the rational numbers, thus the proof is complete. So that was a little bonus called proof by construction. So um, I think that's it. Thanks for watching.